Good morning and peace to you. For all that is going on in this world, I still find great joy in being able to come before you this morning. And I am still filled with a sense of hope in knowing that this is a day that God has prepared for us to share. Therefore, let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, this reminder of gladness is so, so very important right now. Because if I am honest this morning, the last week or so has been filled with events that has left me feeling anything but glad. Just a quick scan of the news to see the things that are happening. We continue to deal with wildfires up and down the state. We are dealing with these fires that are destroying property and devastating lives. At the same time, we have hurricanes, plural, hurricanes that have barreled up the Gulf of Mexico with winds that have pummeled areas of Louisiana and Texas. Need I remind you that close to 180,000 Americans have died because of COVID-19. And though you may not see it as consistently in the news as a few months ago, hundreds and thousands of people are still dying day by day and week by week. Death is not a small thing. As our community is still grieving the loss of one of our beloved members. And there are others in our church who have lost loved ones. And there are those within our community who are dealing with illness, even going in and out of the hospital. It's tough. More, the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin has exposed the fact that the reality of racism remains a gaping open wound that has never been healed. All of these things are happening as a backdrop to the civic ritual of our national political conventions, offering hope and offering fear, offering vision, offering blame. It's all just a lot. So you may say, where, dear pastor? Wherein is the gladness? Well, for me, it begins by acknowledging, as I did in the very beginning, that this day, this very day, is still the day that God has made, filled with new possibilities, filled with new hope. And coming into this place, or clicking on the link, or casting this service from your smartphone onto your TV, and being reminded that God is still present, is that thing that allows us to stay steadied on that rock of truth despite the jostling storm winds and the rising waters of today. Speaking of rocks, today we'll be looking at a time when Jesus uses that object as a metaphor to how they can become blocks that can make us stumble. He also uses it as a metaphor to how they can be turned into rocks that can help us stand. We'll get into that, but first let's begin this morning by hearing the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
The song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, with this reminder that morning by morning new mercies I see, speaks to the wellspring of gladness from which I can tap into when things appear to be grim, when the storm clouds gather, and when the winds and the waves begin to buffet. The awareness of God's great faithfulness becomes a rock in a way. The old folks knew this, at least that's what I used to call them when I was younger. But I can see them, especially in that old country church back down in the South. I can see them with their gray hair and their church hats and sometimes with their ill-fitting suits covering their paradoxically warm yet strong body born from labor in tobacco fields. I can hear them singing those older hymns, usually without a hymn book, verse by verse, they, they knew something about God's faithfulness and the need to find some gladness in that notion, especially when there were so many things that they could not find to be glad about in an area, in a context that was forged in the Jim Crow South. It was in that church house where gladness was found in the singing of hymns, in the testimonies, in the partaking of traditions, in the sharing of scriptures. All of this was passed down generationally and now finds residence within me. So regarding scriptures, I always enjoyed listening to the stories in the Gospels. I love the stories about Jesus and his disciples, and particularly, I love stories that center around the person that I was named after. As you know, my birth name is Peter, and that disciple has always loomed large in my faith formation. He had some great moments, and he also had some not so great moments. The verses that we will now read from Matthew's Gospel is usually categorized in the latter column, but let's hear them now.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version Bible, Matthew 16, verses 21 through 24. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Now, before we go into what is happening in this text, I wanted to burnish my credentials on how much I love Peter. Because Peter means a rock, my parents bought me this inscribed rock, a literal rock, for Christmas when I was about 13 years old. Now, it has been sitting in the corner of my childhood home's foyer for the last 32 some odd years. My mom just sent me those pictures last night. So onward. <laughs> just to give a little context, this conversation that we just heard read happens right before Jesus begins to head on this perilous trip towards Jerusalem. In the passages right before this conversation, Jesus and his disciples were in the district of Caesarea Philippi. And in the shadow of all this pagan revelry, Jesus asked his disciples, who do they say I am? And later he asked, who do you say I am? By the way, this is a very important scene and we will revisit it in a few weeks as we will begin to answer that Christological question for ourselves. Who is Jesus? And how is the vision of who Jesus is affect how we see the world? So stay tuned for that. But up there, it was Peter who answered Jesus saying, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. Now, we are familiar with this, and you could imagine that Peter, Jesus' disciple and friend and confidant, was beaming. Peter, the one who dropped his nets in order to follow Jesus, is not only blessed by Jesus in the company of his peers, but Jesus offers him these greatest words of affirmation and a vote of confidence for his leadership. And then we get this passage where Jesus tells his disciples that he, quote, must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief scribes and the priests and be killed and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter hears this and it says he pulls Jesus aside and says, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen. And of course, things go way into left field, so to speak. And somehow, in some way, it is punctuated by Jesus saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are a stumbling block to me. That's right. He called his, my words, truly favorite disciple, Satan. And there's a rich and dark tradition around what was going on in that moment and who he was talking to, but... There it is. So for today, allow me to offer a new reading of that exchange that can possibly humanize that moment in a new way and possibly also speak to the sense of overwhelm and hopelessness that many are experiencing today. Now, there's a lot going on in that passage and a lot of it will preach, as they say. But I wanted to bring your attention to and just kind of park on that exchange between Jesus and Peter. Jesus, who has just affirmed Peter's proclamation that he was a Messiah, 
now turns to his disciples and says that he is about to die. Not only that, that he's about to be killed. Yes, he, he mentioned his resurrection, but I am sure that Peter didn't even register that. Let, let me posit how Jesus' words could have been translated by the disciples in that moment, and especially Peter. See, there is a personal level that makes Jesus' talk of being killed sound crazy to Peter. Jesus and Peter are close. They both have been given their lives over to this cause. They witnessed and participated in miracles and healings. They are true, true companions. Companions meaning they have broke bread together and experienced the familial intimacy that only happens when you share a table and share life together. But there's another layer to this. When Peter called Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, that had a particular real world meaning. It spoke to the flicker of hope within the Jewish people who were dealing with the dark oppression of foreign occupation. They were dealing with violence by state actors and soldiers who patrolled their neighborhoods and their cities. They were dealing with disenfranchisement from citizenship, meaning they had no rights. They were dealing with the pain of their culture and religion being distorted and erased. They were dealing with the sweep of poverty and constant hunger. They were dealing with a deep knowing that the Roman presence was just the newest iteration of a history of oppression that was, was evidenced by the Greeks before them, and then the Persians and the Medes, and before that the Babylonians, before that the Assyrians, going all the way back to the Egyptians themselves. There was a deep pain, a deep hurt, and a deep sense of communal weariness about this unjust system that played like an ongoing score that formed the discordant background music in the, within the conscious and subconscious thinking of the Jewish people at that time. This is the backdrop of Jesus's ministry, a context of deep pain mixed with a deep longing for salvation and deliverance from centuries-old oppression. The Messiah, the tradition of the Anointed One who was to come, represented the embodiment of God's divine intervention, of God's salvation. The Messiah was the one who was going to break the wheel for my Game of Thrones people. He was the one who was going to save the people, even by military means, from that immediate social and historical and political oppression wrought on by their enemies. You are the Messiah, Peter says. And Jesus affirms that and then immediately says that he, the Messiah, with all of what that represents, will be going to Jerusalem to be tried and killed by the very state and system that he is supposed to be overthrowing. To register that jarring contradiction means for Peter the dashing of hope, a reversal of a dream, a betrayal of expectations. And from that place, Peter says, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. In fact, the word is used there is rebuke, the same word that Peter heard when Jesus commanded the storms to still. How dare you, Jesus, Peter saying, you are the hope that is holding back the consuming sense of hopelessness within a hopeless situation. Peter loved Jesus personally, yes, but he also loved the cause of the kingdom of God to which he gave his life. The Galilee-born ministry was not some abstraction, nor was it only spiritual, but to Peter and others, 
It was a hope-filled movement that would lead to transformative and tangible results. Killed? I forbid it. This will not happen, he said, probably through quickly filling tear-filled eyes. Now, you don't think that Jesus knew that same musical score of hopelessness from which Peter spoke? You don't think that Jesus knew how other people's thought of him and projected on him? You don't think that Jesus at times felt the same way? That same sense of exhaustion and weariness and a sense of when is this going to end? This understanding recontextualizes Jesus' response of get thee behind me, Satan, not as a rhetorical slapdown, but as a statement of solidarity and as a statement of care. I believe that Jesus was not speaking to Peter specifically, but to the spirit that Jesus recognized while he encountered it during the advent of his ministry when he was in the wilderness within the desert being tempted by the tempter for 40 days and 40 nights. And let's be clear about how temptations work. You can only be tempted by something that aligns with your desires. For example, you cannot tempt me with green olives. Yuck. But a Reese's peanut butter cup when I'm supposed to be dieting? Yum. So when Satan tempted Jesus, to use his power to overthrow the powers of this world. What made it a temptation is the fact that on some level it had to resonate with him. Jesus knew the pain from which Peter spoke because as a Jewish man in occupied Rome, he knew the sense of weariness and hopelessness that sometimes permeated the conditions of living. And despite it all, Jesus knew that he had to stay focused as he was teaching his disciples that the work of the kingdom of God, the beloved community coming into full form, does not come easy or without weariness or without suffering or without struggle. It is not some fantastical and triumphant mission of immediacy like Gandalf arriving on a white horse but it is the determination to turn into the teeth of the realities of the pain with the hope of knowing that in the end, somehow, in some way, life and justice must prevail. This movement that Jesus speaks of does not lead us to look away from trouble, but it forces us to look at injustice and pain square in the face. And discipleship moves us to take that risky road to Jerusalem, no matter what may come. But this is not an easy thing. So, to be clear, I do not have all the answers to the things that I said in the beginning that makes it hard to be glad in this moment. Of course, this includes the fires and the hurricanes. This includes the pandemic and the petulance of politics. This includes dealing with the quarantine and issues of maintaining mental wellness. But this also includes the shooting, again, of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I want to bring our attention to that because he was a black man who got shot seven times in the back while leaning into a car in which three of his sons, all under the age of 10, were there and witnessed that violence up close. I think it's safe to say that despite whatever the specifics may emerge, that there had to be a better way to subdue or resolve the issue before seven bullets pierced his back at point-blank range, damaging his spinal cord and leaving him paralyzed and clinging for his life. You know, it felt like his life was expendable. So when Doc Rivers, 
the coach of the LA Clippers, reflected on the shooting of Blake, the coach and the son of a police officer. Of course, Doc, he knows the challenges of policing. He said that enough is enough. And through tearing eyes, he said, and I quote, it's hard when you keep loving this country when this country does not love you back. This feeling is visceral and it explains the reason of why people react the way that they do. Look, whether we want it or not, we are in a moment where we are looking at the hard truths of racism in this country. And I am here to say that like the disciple Peter in first century Palestine, there is a weariness to the black experience. And, and navigating a world in which it feels like your life doesn't matter or that your life is expendable is tough. And it is easy, too easy, to stumble upon a nihilistic block of losing hope in the same way that many of us have been losing sleep. And to be honest with you, I wish there was this definitive Messiah moment to save us, to make it all go away. I wish that there was this perfect meeting, that there was a perfect sermon, a perfect book study, or the perfectly written law, or the perfect outcome of a pivotal election that can poof, undo the history and legacy of the systemic racism that allows me and so many others to feel weary and tired and hopeless. But I know that is not the case. And yet, as I come into this space today, I have a glimmer of gladness. Not because things are perfect, or that the struggle and suffering is gone. Jesus does not guarantee that. But the glimmer of gladness is in seeing the spirit of the Messiah and seeing how the example of Jesus who decided to take that Jerusalem bound road anyhow is showing up in ways both noticeable and subtle. The spirit of the Messiah showed up when the team members of the Milwaukee Bucks decided to boycott their playoff game in the name of justice. It was an act that inspired the rest of the NBA and the WNBA to boycott as well. Not only that, but this act of resistance spread to Major League Soccer and even Major League Baseball. Tennis star Naomi Osaka followed suit in boycotting her match. Something historic happened and the spirit that showed up in their sitting down brought me a little bit of gladness. The spirit of the Messiah showed up when writing this sermon, and, and I was able to recall my ancestors who would sing songs like, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And they sung this song, and so doing so, they testified to a power that allowed them to keep on keeping on, even when the road was rough and the way was weary. That spirit showed up when I hummed that song along with Nancy's rendition. And I was reminded of a God who makes a way out of no way, a God who has put in our people, as my friend says, an uh, indomitable spirit. And this knowing brought me a little bit of gladness. And this spirit of the Messiah showed up in a small and subtle way this week. When I got, when I was sitting back as consuming so much news, which you need to be careful about doing, and I was feeling a little bit down, and, and I saw this number on my cell phone, and a congregant called me out of nowhere, and she said, Pastor, I was thinking about you, and I just want to let you know that I'm keeping you in my prayers. And she also said, I just want to let you know that I love you, and I care for your well-being. That simple conversation, merely three minutes in length, was everything. And it bought me some gladness in my soul. Now, 
Does any of these things fix all of the problems that we've been discussing today? No. But what could have been a stumbling block of hopelessness was transformed into a rock of faith. And this rock of awareness of God's presence with us in the spirit of the Messiah and in those who keep fighting on in the name of hope allows me to keep my feet on that road to Jerusalem and be willing to face whatever may come. Now, there is that whole section about taking up your cross and the cost of discipleship, but we'll save that for another day. I believe I've talked enough this morning. But for now, let us find some rest and renewal in knowing that we are granted another day that God has prepared for us to share. That we are granted another day to know the great faithfulness of God. And that we are granted another day to make real the promises of the kingdom that Jesus spoke of. And even in times of struggle, when we are gifted with these degrees of gladdening grace. This gladdening grace is found when, in those sometimes weary moments, we are reminded that we belong to a tradition that sees God not as someone who judges our vulnerability or our pain, but one who sees it and feels it and gives us the grace that moves us from our stumbling blocks to a standing rock. It is a grace and a peculiar gladness that guides us through the fire and the gales of hurricane winds, and a grace and a gladness that emanates a living testament to the world about the world that we hope to create. In all, may we be renewed morning by morning by the new mercies we see, and may we be strengthened in our stance to struggle for, and if we need, suffer for a vision of hope that includes all people. Amen. May you go with God, and may you go in God's peace.